Okay, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. I'm Juliet Wade, and our guest today is the Nebula-nominated author, Kelly Robson. Hi, Kelly. Hi, 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 hi. How does it feel to have Nebula nominated before your name? Oh, my God. It is so freaking amazing. It is absolutely, uh, you know, a lifelong dream come true. It's so great. So great. Absolutely. Um, yeah. so this is fun, and, um, so it, what, what, what's the official link? So the story is called Waters of Versailles, which I have gotten wrong by adding a the to the front of it a number of times. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. Yeah, right, but, um, how, how long is it? Is it a novella, or is it a novelette? Yeah, it's novella, so it's nominated in the novella category. And it's okay. uh, it's eighteen thousand six hundred words, so it's on the shorter side of uh, novella. Novella cutoff is seventeen thousand five hundred, as you know. So okay, yeah, okay. yeah. So it's well, just it's, a, a lightweight novella. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the shorter side of novella, yeah, but uh, it's it's about as long as it needed to be. So sure, absolutely. That's that's what we that's what we would hope for with stories, right? That they'd be yeah. just as long as necessary. <laughs> yeah, well, when I first uh, when I first drafted it, I was hoping that I would get it quite a bit shorter because, as you know, novellas are really hard to place. So, um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Well, you know, I have to say, um, for for a novella length where you're worried about where to place it, you ended up placing it in a pretty awesome place. <laughs> I did, I did. I was super lucky. Um, you know, the first place I submitted it was FNSF. And um, I thought I thought for sure that I would at least get a personal rejection from Gordon at the time. I thought mm -hmm. I thought that was, you know, I thought the story was good enough to get to that that point. But I didn't expect him to take it. But so I got a stone cold rejection from his editorial assistant. <laughs> Oh. Oh, no. uh, and then I um, I sent it to um, Ga uh, Giga Gi 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 Gigantosaurus. Giganotosaurus. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they bounced it too. And then pretty much at that point, the only place that I could possibly, the only pro market I could possibly think of, you know, to place it at was uh, Tor.com. And um, I did not want it to get stuck in the slush pile, so I just hung on to it. And my partner um, is A.M. Delamonica, Alex Delamonica. Um, mm -hmm. She and I have been married for 27 years. And wow. uh, Yeah, yeah. Long time. <laughs> it's awesome. Longer uh, than me, my husband, so. Yes. More power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's a real milestone. But... Uh, Alex is has been publishing for over 20 years, and she's been selling to Ellen for quite a long time as well. So uh, I guess it was in the fall of 2014. Yeah. So fall of 2014, we went to. Um, so I'd, I'd f actually finished the story in January of 2014. Submitted it, got the rejections, put it away. Thought, oh, where am I going to sell this thing? Someday, someday, maybe. And uh, what happened was we went to visit Alex's publishers in uh, New York, uh, which is Tor. And um, Alex knows Ellen uh, socially, so we spent the afternoon with her and with um, uh, some other writers as well. And um, Alex actually pitched the story to Ellen for me. Ah, and Ellen was awesome. intrigued. And um, so when I got home, I sent her an email saying, "Are you? Sh would you like to see this? Here's the just the email that I just described to you before we started recording." And right, she right. Said, yeah. She said, "Yeah," and she um, she emailed me back a few days later. It was so quick. A few days later, and she said, "Like her her acceptance was so unequivocal." She said, "It's perfect. I love it." It is so oh, wow. cool. And here's the contract. Fantastic. What a great oh. story. <laughs> well, you know, that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, just, 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 you know, to humble me, to humble me. I am currently have a story uh, that has not been accepted by Ellen yet. It has gone through now five revisions with her, and she still oh, has. Wow. So, just just so you don't think that I think I'm this perfect, you know, goddess of <laughs> of uh, perfect writing. It's not the case. I was just very lucky with Waters of Versailles. Wow. Well, okay. So Waters of Versailles. This is this is just a a delightful and touching story. And and I'm curious, what was the kernel of the story for you that that got you started on this idea? Yeah, the the kernel was um well I was uh I read um nonfiction history nonfiction for fun. So okay. I think the first kernel was let's talk about world building. This is amazing. Oh, okay. So Nancy Mitford's book, uh, The Sun King. So mm -hmm. I bought this and I was just reading it for fun and it's fascinating and it's great and I got really interested reading this book. I got really interested in the actual building of Versailles. Mm -hmm. So then I picked up this book which is by Tony Spaworth. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, and it's, you know, it's not as intriguing as it looks. It's a, it's a good book. It's a good book, but it's uh, it's not quite as juicy as Nancy Mitford. You can count on Nancy to be juicy. Uh, so I read this, and um, as I was going through it, you can see my, my little um, marks in here. Nice, nice. I, got, I like it. I got really fascinated by the water system at Versailles. They actually, um, they actually did... Okay, so I'm giving. I'm. I'm. This is going to be spoilers for the people who haven't read the story, but uh, they actually did have in in 1738 when when I set the story. They actually had toilets at Versailles, flush toilets. Um, Versailles was absolutely the most sumptuous palace palace in the Western world, but it was also a place that was full of a lot of squalor. Uh, when you've got so many people living in a building, there are thousands of people living in Versailles, and uh, water was a serious problem for them. Mm. One of the things that they actually did was they actually turned one of the rivers around. They made it flow in the other direction to get water into Versailles. So, so that was basically the, uh, yeah, I mean, check out the book. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> wow. So that was the thing that got me started uh, thinking about uh, setting a story at Versailles and um, you know that now, one of Can I ask you one thing since yeah. you since you read the book um, have you, oh, for ha first of all have you ever been to Versailles? I have not. Okay, I'm just curious and then the other thing is my, I have heard that Paris actually has two separate water systems one for the fountains and one for the people <laughs> and <laughs> and I don't know whether that holds true for something a place like Versailles which is outside of Paris so it wouldn't be on quite the same system necessarily it depends on what was going on there when the kings were living there yeah well that's kind of funny because um, fountains tradition in the Middle Ages fountains were water systems you had a, a beautiful fountain, but um, but it wasn't there for decorative purposes only. It was it was there. People would actually get water out of the fountain. Mm -hmm. So um so yeah so that's that's really cool. I'm gonna have to look that up. In it's very cool Let's see. tidbit. Let's see if it leads you to something new. <laughs> it, does, it does. It does. So at the time when I was um I, I first started drafting Waters of Versailles, I uh, I was um I had this amazing gig writing the wine column for Chatelaine magazine which is Canada's largest women's magazine mm -hmm. so I was I was getting dropped into this amazing world of people who are so passionate and geeky about wine and about fine living and vineyards and all this sort of stuff so it was it was this this window in into a world that uh, that I really you know I didn't belong in I'm just you know, it was a goof from rural Alberta, but um, no, seriously. Uh, 
<laughs> but you know, all these these people who are you know used to the finer things in life. So, so there's a bit of that in the story as well. That idea of uh, you know being a bit of a fish out of water. Uh -huh. um, is my main character Sylvain is from from the Alps, from the Southern Alps, and uh, and he's a he's a manly man. He's a hunter and a fisher and. Uh, you know, a, a lover of women and a fighter of men and uh, all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. And and being being in Versailles is is, is it, it's the place where he wants to be because it is the seat of all power and he wants to be there uh, and he wants to take power for himself. He wants to be rich and revered and feared and he just wants to be the top man at Versailles. But um, but uh, the simple fact is that you can't respect hardly any of the people there because they are shallow and and lazy and just not the kind yeah. of people that he really likes. So his journey is is to find, you know, his own place and his yeah, own... Yeah, to find what's really important for him, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think I think the question of of power is a really interesting one in the story, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways because you have two different kinds of power in the story, uh, and he's standing in between them, trying to negotiate between them in a sense. Um, and one of them is the power of the nobility and the aristocracy and the the opulent richness etc cetera, etc cetera. and the other is the power of nature and of where he comes from and it's operationalized quite literally in the story um, and he's and he's there trying to have one foot on either side of the divide yeah 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 it's he, really uh, interesting thanks um, uh, One of the so again, this is going to be spoilery, but um, be spoilery because that's what we're about here. <laughs> well, why not? Why not be spoilery? So, so what he has actually done is he has um, he has in in the backstory in the story he is um, has realized that uh, at the time that we are we're at the time of Louis the Fifteenth and. Versailles has gone into ruin because the king hasn't been there for many, many years. He's still a young man and uh, and he's been living elsewhere, but he has come back to Versailles and the court has come back to Versailles. And Versailles is not in good condition and the fountains don't work and the building is not in good condition. Um, and what he decides is he realizes that this is a fantastic opportunity for him to take power for himself by uh, Going in and basically uh, arriving at Versailles and taking the waterworks for his own and making them work properly. And the way that he does this is um, he is from the mountains, he's from the Alps, and in the Alps there are magical nixies that live in the glacial pools. And uh, what he does, and this is in the backstory, um, is he captures a tiny little nixie, which is in tadpole form. And he puts it into a canteen, and he takes it to Versailles. He holds, holds it, uh, in you know, secretly inside of his shirt. And when he gets into Versailles, he coaxes the Nixie out into the into the cisterns, and um, she starts to grow up. And she is um, incredibly capable, magically capable of controlling the flow of water. So with her help, he is able to. Uh, to make the yeah. water flow the way he wants, um, and and she's a child, and she is uh, bored, and mischievous, and self-centered, and not very interested in doing what she's told, and he has to nurture her. Basically, he doesn't want to be a mother, he doesn't want to be a nanny to a magical creature, but he is absolutely forced to be that. Or to become that, and um, and where that comes from is, you know, I once took care of my little two-year-old niece for 36 mm -hmm. hours all by myself. Once I have never been more freaking exhausted. 
in my entire life. <laughs> I hear you on that. <laughs> Anybody who has children, I'm sure that's not a surprise to them. Um, how, how old were you when you had this experience? Oh, this was, uh, so I suppose I was 40. Okay. <laughs> It was exhausting. It really was. If you're not used to it, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. Kids are, jeez. Yeah. Oh. I, I mean, mean, the only thing, that make, the only thing that makes two years old seem easy, is having done one year old and zero years old. Oh yeah. No, I, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. It was just <laughs> one kid, and I was just utterly like. At one point, I was literally lying on the floor, and she came over and she put a pillow under my head, as she could tell I was so exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> she was a good kid. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so um, so Sylvain's got his work cut out for him, trying to negotiate being a, a courtier in mm -hmm. in Versailles, uh, having a new love affair with a very beautiful and powerful woman, which uh, the story starts out with a sex scene, <laughs> and uh, um, keeping his social standing up appearing at all of the social events that he needs to at the I don't know if you know this but one of the things that you had to do when you were a courtier at Versailles um, or at least a male courtier and I suppose the females did too for the Queen is that you actually had to attend on the King you had to go and show up for the King when he got up in the morning and watch him get up and just hang out while he got up out yeah. of bed and went and had a crap and got cleaned up and got dressed and it was it was this incredible honor to be to be witness to the king's everyday getting up and doing shit it's just bizarre but <laughs> so the man isn't getting much sleep and he's got a lot of things going on and he's got all of these pipe systems that are uh, that he has um, retrofitted into the into the um, the palace with the help of a couple of uh, workmen. And he's got these big um, reservoirs up on the rooftops and he's adding more and adding more. And uh, the reason why he is having to add more and more and more and get, get more pipes into the palace is that he has hit on this really great money-making scheme is um, to start installing toilets in the palace. And of course <laughs> the first toilet goes to the king and the king likes it. And then the next toilet has to go to, well, is it going to go to the king's mistress or is it going to go to the queen? Hmm. Problem. Uh, ends up going to the mistress. And then everybody who's anybody wants a toilet. And it's fantastic because he can make money this way and get power and start trading influence and um, favors. And, you know, he becomes a, a sought-after powerful man. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to I'm going to remark that one of one of the delightful choices that you made was to call all the toilets thrones. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, Which I just love this sort of uh, sarcasm I guess in that choice like it's sort of we all want to be like the king we want a throne kind of <laughs> I think it's you know it's sort of a little uh, impudent wag in the face of, of, of royalty kind of touch. I loved it. Um, of course everybody wants a throne. They want to be like the king. <laughs> and and Sylvain has has thrones tucked away in uh, in warehouses in the town of Versailles and and uh, if he, um, I think there's a line that if um, if kingship were conferred by the number of thrones a man had, he would be king of Europe. So, <laughs> um, it, it was it was a really fun reveal. Is that the the toilets come into the I think the second or third scene, and at first they Sylvain is talking about thrones, so the the reader doesn't necessarily know that we're talking about toilets until I I spring it on them, okay. and. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's kind of fun because with a little bit of story mechanics in that scene is we all, I hope, love cats. I love cats. I know Juliet loves cats. Uh, is that um, the king's cat, Manu, has uh, decided that she really likes to sit on the throne. 
And uh, so this is a bit of a problem because the king can't use it because the cat's on it, and he's a cat lover, so he can't move the cat. So uh, what the king wants is the king wants a second throne. And uh, <laughs> so yeah. that's how we introduce the whole throne thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Sylvain spends a lot of the time wet in the story. <laughs> he does. He does. Um, because, uh, because the, the Nixie, the little fish, she never actually gets a name. He calls her Little Fish. And um, she is so powerful, she's able to control water so, that, so well that at the beginning of the story when she's, she's bored and she wants to play, uh, she is basically targeting him with drips all around, as he walks around the palace. He's chasing him and, uh, and causing problems for him. And, yeah. So he's uh, at the very first scene. He's um, he's pulling off his seduction of this powerful woman, and uh, as he is making love to her, he's getting spattered by drips coming from all places. He can't quite get away from them, but he has to uh, perform sexually. So <laughs> it's a it's a very amusing opening. Let's just yes. say. Well, it's a, if if you're gonna write a sex scene, it, it's um it's it's a really fun way to approach a sex scene is is to have something external going on mm -hmm. while people are are making love, whether that be you know drips coming down from the pipes overhead of the ceiling that you can't quite get away from, no matter you know how far you push the sofa over the chaise lounge, <laughs> um, or you know. I don't know having office supplies falling off of the uh, off of the shelves above you or something like that. It's it's a it's a fun way to do a sex scene without having to get too deep into the uh, to the physical description. The physical description, which I enjoy, but it wasn't appropriate for this story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I, as I always say about sex scenes, you kind of have to have more than just tab A into slot B. <laughs> Because everybody knows that part, so yeah. you know what else is going on is actually the more interesting part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it ends up being very playful and and I think also in some sense it's um, uh, it does my favorite thing that I like to do when I'm trying to create a first scene, which is it sort of encapsulates the problem in one little scenelet, right? He's got, he's trying to make his way into <laughs> <laughs> rich and powerful spaces, right? Except That's exactly right. a water problem. <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. It's a concrete metaphor for his, uh, his whole problem. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, when so I first started drafting this story back in, I think, 2010, and it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. And um, I, uh, what happened was, and I, I've written about this on my blog, um, so I wrote several beginning drafts, probably about 10,000 words of, of stuff that I eventually just had to throw away. And... Um, what happened was, you know, we all, we all know what it's like to be working on something that's just not quite clicking. Uh, and you're just looking and hoping to find that one piece of advice or that one piece of inspiration that, that helps you get what you know you're missing. And I actually got that at a mm -hmm. convention. And I'm going to give it to you. Um, so I got this piece of advice at a convention in Oregon at Oricon. In, uh, mm -hmm. in 2012. And this piece of advice came from um, Stephen Barnes. I don't know if you know him. He's Tanana Reeves' uh, husband. Really great writer. Amazing, uh, amazing writer. Amazing guy. Mm -hmm. so what he said, and this was at a, at a panel, and we were talking, I can't even remember what the topic of the story was, but here was his piece of advice that worked for me. He said, you can approach, a, when you get a story idea, 
you usually you will either have an idea for a character or you'll have an idea for a problem. If you start with the problem, if the problem is what you've got, to flesh out that idea you should think, who is the absolute worst person to give this problem to? Hmm. If you've got character, if you're starting out with character, you should ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen to this character? And how can I make him do it to himself or herself? <laughs> so this was a fantastic piece of advice, and it was my eureka moment. And uh, what I realized was the reason why Waters of Versailles wasn't working, uh, um, mm -hmm. it wasn't working because I had originally given the problem to the wrong character. Mm. So Bob was a completely different guy in my first drafts. He was more of a... Um, a sensitive aesthete, he was asexual, he was um, moving his way around the palace in a very fake way, uh, more of a, um, you know, Scarlet Pimpernel sort of character. Ah, and, interesting. Yeah, and, uh, and, you know, there was absolutely no reason why that character couldn't have solved the problem on page six of the story. So yeah. That's why I, wasn't yeah. Working. So um, so what happened was I, on, <laughs> on April Fool's Day 2013, I got laid off of my job. Oh, wow. And I was, oh, it was horrible. I was devastated. Um, and, and the very next day, to make myself feel better, I accompanied Alex to a coffee shop, and we sat down with our friend, Camille Alexa, do you know her? Writer. And, um, and, and I started the story from scratch. I threw out everything and I started writing that first scene, the sex scene. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, finally, and that was when the story worked. So that was the wow. thing that made the story work for me. That was my artistic breakthrough, was uh, writing Water of Versailles. Everything that I've sold since then has been written since then. Everything that I wrote before then is in the trunk, and uh, wow. I, finally, I finally got it, what I was missing. And so that piece of advice from Stephen Barnes was really useful. And the other thing was the thing that I learned drafting Waters of Versailles, it took six months, um, was uh, scene craft. To really focus on every single scene as if it's its own uh, short story with its own hook mm -hmm. and its own conclusion and uh, to be really careful about what each scene is doing in a story. So th those were my uh, those were my Eureka cool. moments. And that's cool. uh, how I got a Nebula nomination! <laughs> <laughs> Go Kelly! <laughs> we'll have a little dance party here in the middle. Because <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, because woohoo! Damn right. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know? So, um, I, yeah, I'm I'm really intrigued. Let's see. Let me go back and see if there's something else. So, did the title was the title something that just sort of sprang out at you? Was it was it called Waters of Versailles from the very beginning? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, the title was always there. I think. Um, mm -hmm. The story uh, arc was pretty much there. Uh, Walter John Williams, who um, I went to Tao's Toolbox in 2007. He was my teacher at Tao's Toolbox. Tao's Toolbox is a great workshop, by the way. Uh, it's two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, less of a time time sink than uh, than Clarion West um, or Clarion. Uh, he he calls. Um, what I tend to do is when I start, a, when I get a story idea, I have the beginning and the end and a couple of points along the way. And he mm -hmm. calls that the three-stage rocket sort of mm. idea. Um, I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily know how I'm getting from the beginning to the next stage to the next right. stage to the end, but, uh, but I, I do have a general trajectory. So, yeah, so I knew um, I, knew I had to get... Uh, the little fish into the um, champagne fountain 
for the conclusion at the end, where uh, this this is uh, Sylvain's moment to stop being a uh, stop being a jerk, and to yeah. realize that he uh, that he actually really um, likes being a father or a mother or a nanny or a caregiver to this mm -hmm. uh, magical creature, that he actually likes it and loves the little loves the little creature for itself. Mm -hmm. And um, you've told us a bit about your research on the, the, on the period. I mean, I think it was really great. Um, the choice to use Louis XV, I think, was really a great one because it shows the sort of the decadence of the whole thing and everything's starting to kind of go downhill, right? Yeah. We can sense the Polish queen's demise in her mere mention. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that, actually, the story is going to get reprinted in Poland. It's going to get a translation in Poland. Wow. I, uh, oh, wow. I, don't, I don't have the contract yet, but, um, yeah, so um, so one of the things that is going on at Louis Kahn's time is, is this dude had mistresses up the wazoo. <laughs> He, uh, the king really liked women, and uh, women really liked him. And uh, one of the things that was actually happening at this exact time, at this exact time in 1738, was he had a maîtresse en titre, and mm -hmm. the official maîtresse, the mistress, the, the uh, you know, she actually had an official an official title and she had official rooms and she was the declared mistress of the king. He had other mistresses too. But at the time at the time when the story is set, she brings her sister to court and the king takes her sister as a mistress as well. And that's mm. kind of gross. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So this is happening in the background of my story, and, and it's it's one of the things that kind of Sylvain is is kind of disgusted by that this uh, the social maneuvering and the idea that yeah you know I, I don't want to be all you know anti polygamy or anything, but um, because I think polygamy is great when everybody agrees that that's a fantastic thing, but. Um, <laughs> Right, but I mean, isn't it isn't it one of those things where power makes it really hard to tell if there's consent in a lot of cases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's what you're kind of getting at here is that the power of the king is what makes these various relationships so unsavory in a way, because you don't know what, what whether they mean anything to anybody. Exactly, exactly. So one of um. When Sylvain starts, when we start the story, Sylvain is is seducing um, one of the ladies in waiting who waits on the the official mistress, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's he is seducing her, and he doesn't actually know whether she's into it or not, or whether she's just having sex with him because he's powerful and she's decided to give in. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, and as the story progresses, they develop a real relationship, the two of them. She's mm -hmm. genuinely interested in him and he becomes genuinely interested in her and uh, one of the um, one, of, one of the ways I wish this, the, I think the story kind of breaks the mold a little bit is that there isn't a romantic conclusion. There looks mm -hmm. like there's a romantic conclusion but it actually doesn't quite, it doesn't happen and uh, the story goes off in a, a more of a um, <laughs> more of a domestic kind of love situation at the end with a yeah. father-daughter sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is that you've obviously got a lot of really deep research on the on the Versailles side of it. What was your engagement with the Alpine side of it? Yeah. So I'm from um, I'm from the mountains. Okay. I'm from, uh, from Jasper. Mm -hmm. um, so Jasper Park, um, I grew up just outside of Jasper Park, um, so that's a uh, uh, national park in, in Canada, in Alberta. 
And you know, I I love those mountains. So the, these are the mountains where um, Brook Mac Mountain was um, was filmed, right? Mm. So you for that we can all remember the incredible vistas in that movie. Yeah. Um, I love them. I love them. I just I would love to have those mountains in my life. When I look at pictures of them, I tear up. Mm -hmm. I, they call to my heart. I can't live there. I can't live there. I hated living there as a child. Um, it's not a good place for a, a lesbian to be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, small towns generally not too friendly. Um, but, God, I love those mountains. So when I'm talking about uh, the glaciers and the scree slopes and the uh, the mountain rills and the streams, uh, you know, that's 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 direct from from the yearning of my heart for those mountains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I love them. And that, and I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever had water straight from a glacial stream. Oh. I think I have, but not for a long <laughs> time. The most yeah. delicious water you'll ever taste in your life. So, and this is this is something that uh, that Sylvain yearns for, is that mm -hmm. he yearns for the uh, for the mountains and for the people of the mountains. He has great love for uh, for um, the the shepherds in the mountains and the people and the uh, and the foresters in the mountains as well. So. Yeah, he just loves it, and uh, yet he is living in Versailles. Yeah, yeah, fish out of water, as it were. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so I'm, um, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, you say what you were going to say. No, I would. Um, I want to go back. I want to write more in this. Uh, mm -hmm. this milieu. I'm hoping to. Uh, so, um, Annette is uh, is uh, Sylvain's lover. Uh -huh. I'm gonna go back, and I'm going to. I'm hoping that what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll write another novella with her, and then I'll write another novella where they come back together again. Mm. So well, maybe I'll end up with uh, quite possibly end up with something that looks somewhat like a book at the end. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. Oh, that would be a fascinating thing. Hmm. There's a. Uh, in this world, um, it, it's not really delved into, but. Uh, there are um, magical creatures are known to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, human animal hybrids are um, are a are a thing that people believe in as having existed in the past, and that a lot of people know still exist somewhere, rarely but can be found. Um, uh -huh. So. The Nixie is is one of them. She's um, a child-sized salamander human hybrid, mm. and um, and uh, it's it's hinted at it. I'll give you a hint. It's hinted at it that um, that the the king of France's genetic line has some horse in it. <laughs> hinted, just hinted. Um, but that's uh, so. Just to give you a clue, if I ever manage to pull this off, that's going to be uh, very important to the third book. So, uh, what a kick! Just <laughs> implications. Imagine the implications of having a royal lover who's part horse. If you got pregnant, is a possibility that you could give birth to a centaur? <laughs> Possible. Okay, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that doesn't get explored so much in this story, but I'll no, be very curious to see where you take it. Yeah, well, it would be a lot longer story if we uh, if we got into that. It wasn't appropriate for this story, but we'll see. It's intriguing. Yeah. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be inter interested to see what you what you pursue there. Did you actually research any songs? I didn't. No, I just made them up. 
they're, they're, they're sort of barely hinted at, and I didn't know whether that was something that you had pursued or whether it was something that you were just hinting at in the story. No, it's just, uh, no, there, um, so there are two occasions. One of the things is um, the little fish is one of her refrains when she is bugging him for entertainment is she asks him to sing for her and sing a song, sing a song, sing a song. This is very important to her. She really wants somebody to sing to her. And uh, he breaks down and does it twice. And, at one, and in one occasion, he's, uh, she's very, very sad. So he sings her a, a, a solemn, comforting song that he is familiar with from, uh, from the mountains, from, um, from the shepherds. And then another point, he is incredibly happy with her because she has shown him a new dimension of her, her powers that he hadn't any idea about. And uh, so he breaks into a celebration song at that point, and that's a, a song that he heard from um, the foresters in his, uh, his alpine, uh, well, his alpine land in the Alps. Mm -hmm. So, But no, they aren't actually really songs, I just... They don't have to be. I was just curious. You know, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about world building is that you don't have to know everything. Mm -mm. You just have to seem like you know everything. Exactly. So, so if you have if you have really really deep knowledge in this this and this, and it and it shows on the page, then you can do a whole lot more than just that. Yeah. And will trust you. Yeah, you just keep it. <laughs> you have such <laughs> obvious, you have such obvious grounding in all these things. I mean, like in a way, this is what speculative fiction is about. When we talk about realism in speculative fiction, what we're doing is we're kind of grounding the fantasy, right? In order for us to be able to say, okay, I'm going to believe in this, you have to establish a level of trust, and you have to use certain things to establish that trust because you're going to want to make sure that you have the leeway to make up all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. and get really specific, right? You don't have yes. to know any, everything, but, but if you just put in like one specific detail that feels really real to people, um, you can get away with a lot. Yep. Um, I'm working on a I'm working on a time travel story right now, which is um, set in Mesopotamia. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and um, gosh, you know I don't know that much about Mesopotamia. I've only read like three books about it, but um, <laughs> only three. <laughs> you know, it's not enough, uh, but but I'm hoping that just by getting really, really specific about some things and by making up things that um, that seem plausible, that uh -huh. specific things that seem plausible. So one of the things that I just made up like yesterday is that um, uh, the there's a, a bunch of people who are confronting a, um, okay, so a bunch of uh, farm workers in Mesopotamia Mm -hmm. it is, this is 2238 BC. Wow. Have been, have been confronted by um, the, the time travelers of these, these cameras that are basically doing a survey of the Mesopotamian Valley. So they're, mm -hmm. they're floating remote cameras. They're basically dr drones, camera drones, and they're going around and they're filming everything. Uh -huh. And uh, at one point, my main character has basically taken virtual control of this camera drone so she's looking out of its optics and there are a bunch of um, farm workers who are looking at the camera who are really freaked out by it and what they do is they get into a line and they hold their fingers like like this in front of yeah. their belly buttons like this so they've got holding their hands like this in front of their belly buttons and so that it's it's like an evil eye sort of situation their their belly button is looking out of this at oh yeah uh -huh. 
So basic, and that, so I'm just hoping that, that that will be like I don't, you know, I just made that up. That doesn't actually exist in Mesopotamia, <laughs> but the evil eye did exist at the time, right? And the evil mm -hmm. eye is something most of us are pretty familiar with, and it was a ward against evil. So I'm hoping that that specific detail will just that I made up out of whole cloth will uh, will be specific enough that people go, "Hey, Kelly knows that stuff." <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, we have had a, an awesome discussion, and we've heard a lot about Waters of Versailles, a little bit about what you're up to, what you're looking forward to, and what you're up to currently. And on uh, Che Morgan, do you have any questions for Kelly before we wrap up? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> just in awe, on. Kelly. What can we say? <laughs> cool. I, I see Che's life goal and uh, Chaos Toolbox. <laughs> Chaos Toolbox? Yeah, awesome. You yeah. should definitely go. <laughs> Someday when I have money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. hard, it's hard, it's really worth it. And one of the one of the things that you, you gain from any of those any of them, the greatest thing that you gain is is the relationships that you form with the people who are there with you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely do it if you can, if you possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I started writing when I was living in Japan and didn't actually start going to places where other authors were until my son was three months old. So I haven't been able to go to any of those workshops at all. But I've been to one-day workshops and yeah. local ones. So, yeah. I mean, you do what you can, right? <laughs> For sure, for sure, and not everybody can do them, but you know, if you can, they're great, for sure. Yeah, no, highly recommended. And and even you know what, even the one day ones or even like three hours, you you never know who you're going to meet. Yeah. Um, and how it might how it might change your life. So I mean, because I had help from people. I mean, there's the wonderful thing about this business is there's so many people looking out, waiting to help people up. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, no, they absolutely are, and the relationships are so so important. To, uh, you, you know, it's a solitary pursuit, but it, you, we can't be solitary all the time. So this is one of the reasons why something like this is fantastic, because I get to meet you. Mm -hmm. I get to meet Morgan and Che. Yeah, and I am taking notes madly over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll um and. Uh, you know, um, I'll look you up, both of you, Morgan and Che, I'll look you up on Facebook and on Twitter, and we'll, you know, stay in touch. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us, Kelly. It's been fantastic. And um, Thanks for having I, I, I think next week we're going to have another topic hangout, and I think it was, it's going to be the one that we... Um, didn't end up doing last week, which was social media. So um, that'll be next Wednesday at 10. And hopefully we'll see everybody um, next week. Kelly, I am, don't imagine I'll see you next week, but you're welcome anytime. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's <laughs> All great. right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Much. I'm stopping. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.